Thank you for joining today's webinar, Improving GIS Data Management for Utilities and Telecommunications Companies. This webinar is part of the GeoConnects webinar series for these two industries. My name is Tom Coolidge, and I am ESRI's Pipeline and Gas Utility Industry Manager. I am facilitating today's webinar. I think you'll find our time together today to be interesting, informative, and helpful to your understanding of how your organization can better manage GIS data. I'd like to introduce two colleagues. Joining me today is Kevin Mackey. He is an account executive on ESRI's utilities and telecommunications team. Kevin account manages a number of utilities and telecommunications companies. He has worked in these industries for a total of 24 years and has been with ESRI since 2008. Also joining me is Tom DeWitt. He is the technical lead for gas on ESRI's utilities and telecommunications team. In that role, Tom works to identify how the ArcGIS platform can be best applied in the gas industry. Prior to assuming his current role, Tom worked in training and professional services. Next month, he will celebrate being at ESRI 20 years. The 2018 GeoConnects webinar series has been put together to give you a more complete understanding of how a modern GIS platform can be used within utility and telecommunications companies. In March, the series began with a webinar on the complete GIS platform. Today's webinar on data management is the second in the series. Our next session in May will cover monitoring. A key component of GIS is the ability to monitor network assets, both mobile and fixed, and proactively use that streaming data for better network management and operations. As part of this session, we'll also be covering the ArcGIS Geo Event Server Extension. We'll be closing out the spring portion of our series by looking at constituent engagement. This is really providing information products such as coverage maps, outage maps, and visibility into operations in the network, and delivering those and other maps to all stakeholders external to your company. We'll be taking a brief break in the summer. The fall portion of our series then kicks off September 12th with a look at field mobility. With such a large proportion of staff and contractors working in the field, Assuring they can readily access real-time network information is increasingly important. Access to current, needed information on any device, anytime, anywhere is essential for a well-performing field workforce. We'll be closing out the series with a look at analytics on October 10th. Analytics provides the insights that are essential to understanding what is going on in the network and to enable better management and operation of those networks. If you can't make any of these particular sessions, don't worry. All the webinars are recorded and the links will be shared with attendees. So don't forget to register to make sure you get the links, even if there's a chance you can't attend all of the webinars. Before we get started, please take a moment to note the webinar control panel on your screen. I would like to encourage you to post your questions in the GoToWebinar questions dialog box during the presentation as they occur to you. We will answer as many questions as time permits after the presentation. And if we can't answer all questions during today's allocated time, we'll answer them later in a FAQ, which we'll distribute to all attendees. Please also note you can switch between telephone and computer speaker audio and adjust your view to full or partial screen. And again, please note today's webinar is being recorded. Here's a brief overview of today's agenda. First, we'll look at value and use cases for data management and electric, gas, and telecommunications companies. Then we'll be looking at what makes good GIS data management. Next, we'll talk about how GIS data management leads to the end goal of having what we refer to as a digital twin of your assets and the world around them. Fourth, we'll highlight how GIS data management is much more than just network management. And after that, we'll focus on how you can get started in improving your data management. Finally, as mentioned before, 
in the time remaining, we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. As you may recall from the previous webinar, ESRI offers a complete modern GIS platform. ArcGIS can be thought of as a system of systems, including a system of engagement, providing capabilities for sharing and collaboration, a system of record, providing data and capabilities for data management, a system of insight, providing capabilities for analytics, a system of IoT, providing capabilities to consume in real time data from sensor networks, and a system for developers to further evolve the platform's extensive general capabilities. And for this webinar, we'll, we will be focusing on a common pattern of use for the GIS system of record, which is data management. Today, GIS data management is undoubtedly being done in all of your organizations, but increasingly there are growing requirements of GIS data. Drivers such as regulatory requirements, increased competition, new services, safety, and many others are creating new requirements for geographic data. So it's more important than ever to improve the quality of the data and the capabilities around GIS data management in support of those new requirements to the end that you can ultimately create a digital twin of your networks and the world around them. ESRI has always been the world leader in GIS data management, and we've just re-engineered our tools for even easier and better data management. With that, please welcome my colleague, Kevin Mackey. Thanks, Tom, I really appreciate that. Now, before we get into the key aspects of GIS data management and some of the new capabilities of ArcGIS, it's important to understand why we've needed to re-engineer our data management capabilities. And this was really driven by you, our customers. Our customers' GIS implementations have grown significantly over the years. GIS is now a mission-critical system in the enterprise, and our data has evolved to meet business and regulatory needs. In this slide, we can see that evolution beginning on the left. We began with migrations from paper or AutoCAD. We instantiated GIS workflows and standards to maintain that quality. Then many of you had imagery that was in individual business units or on folks' desk, desk, desktops, and you realized the value in creating an imagery library for the entire enterprise to use. LiDAR really changed the game in terms of accuracy and scale. Uh, many of our customers now have their own LiDAR devices and are even using drones to capture and analyze information the same day. Now we're creating 3D models of our data and really beginning to visualize and analyze our data in those terms. When we started, most of us didn't even capture the Z value of our assets. And now we're doing line of sight analysis, full 3D modeling of networks and of our network assets inside buildings. The advent of Internet of Things, of IoT, put sensors on our assets, providing real-time feeds about the status of our crews and equipment. Combining space and time into 3D maps provides new insights in the systems you manage. Many of our customers have created analytics teams with data scientists to harness big data. This data is saturated with geographic elements and, how, and GIS helps filter those elements into geographic layers of information to create more useful maps for decision-making. The ArcGIS platform has been re-engineered to manage, analyze, and visualize all of these data, and many of our customers are doing just that. Tom, could you please show us some examples? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That was a really long list of data types that you listed there, and not everyone may be familiar with all those data types. So let me take a minute to kind of introduce some of these different geospatial data types to you. Let's start with the data type that everyone is familiar with, vector data. So here I have my gas system viewer web map. And if I simply zoom in, then I will start to see my vector data show up on the screen. In this case, the first thing I see are all these pipes that I have across my network. And if I zoom in even further, I will see greater detail of my information, such as these meters and these fittings. 
So vector data, points, lines, and even polygons, something I think everybody's familiar with. And also with that, we need to think about tabular data. And tabular data, I'm gonna add one in here to show that. Oftentimes comes in the form of spreadsheets. So here I have a leaks Excel spreadsheet. And if I simply point to it and open it up, it is very easy to add that onto the map and spatially enable that spreadsheet so that I can see these leaks that were in that spreadsheet. So that's our starting point of vector and tabular data. But let's move on to one of the other ones Kevin talked about, imagery. Now, imagery comes in many flavors. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the living atlas, which everyone has access to, to show some of the different types of imagery that maybe you're not familiar with. Let's start with the easy one, base map imagery. All right, so I add that on and I can see the imagery for the whole planet. If I zoom in nice and close, I can get greater detail. And I can just keep zooming in here and it'll just get better and better. Showing me that world imagery. But another type of imagery, as I show in the list here, is multispectral. In this case, we'll take a look at Landsat. And Landsat covers a big area, so I'm going to zoom out here a little bit. And we'll add in that Landsat imagery. This will present, as we see here, different colors representing the different bands of, of wavelengths of light that we can see. And then the other one is temporal imagery, which is the use of raster data to show changes over time. And a really good example of that is, I have it here, scroll down a little bit further. There it is, precipitation change by 2050. And this one is also a very large geography. So let me zoom out and we'll take a look at that. And there we go. So I now see this re color rendering of the changes that are expected to happen to precipitation between now and 2050. So those are some different types of imagery. Now the next one Kevin talked about was LIDAR, which technically stands for light detection and range, or as I like to call it, radar playing with lasers. And what I see here is in the purplish pink, those little dots in a line, those are actual reflections of the individual power lines to give you an idea of just how detailed this LIDAR data can be. And these point clouds are three-dimensional, so I can pan and zoom in this web app and really take a look at that three-dimensional information the red being the rooftops and again those purple dots being those power lines i can see them stacked up there i can see the green for the leaves of the tree cover really impressive information presented to me in three dimensions but three dimensions has evolved as well in terms of rendering so my next example when it comes to 3d is a rendering of a new development complex or again three-dimensional here in the web browser, and I can look around at this. And with this type of detail of buildings, I have the ability to say, well, if I'm interested in renting that apartment there in the upper story, what's my view look like? Well, we rotate around, and with this level of detailed three-dimensional rendering, I can get a sense of what kind of view I might have outside of that window. So that is three-dimensional. Now the next one that Kevin mentioned was real-time. Now real-time is not a specific data format in itself. It's really more of a process of using the data as soon as it is captured. So here I have a dashboard. It's a dashboard showing cable bandwidth in the Tampa metro area 
And as you notice, the numbers are changing every 20 seconds or so. And the value of this, of monitoring this information is real time, is to catch the spikes in bandwidth utilization that might otherwise be lost if we average out the bandwidth utilization over, say, a few hours or a day. That's an example of real time. And then my last one here is big data. Now, big data is, if you think of your sensors data out there, right? And it's repeatedly and consistently capturing information from things like your smart meters, your SCADA devices, uh, other maybe pressure monitoring devices, or in this case, bandwidth utilization devices then that repeated capturing this information grows very quickly and we call it big data because very quickly you have not just gigabytes of data but petabytes of information and storing this time aware sensor data is then generically referred to as big data now in this example that i have here what i'm showing you are 6 month time slices of the bandwidth utilization in the Orlando community area. And you can see as it's showing these hot spots as they grow and, and change over time, you start to get a feel for the, the change in utilization areas and where maybe certain areas like downtown Orlando requires additional attention. But understanding that big data that mass of information can be challenging, and that's where we have special tools, and we start talking about things like geoanalytics that can mine that information and present it to us more conclusively and, and give us this information and find those nuggets that maybe otherwise would be lost. So, for example, you know, looking at the heat maps, I don't know about you, but I didn't quite notice that there were new hotspots showing up here on the northeast corner of the Orlando area, or that down here I have a consecutive hot spot in this Oak Ridge area. Um, cold spots, so where we have low utilization out here in the down here at the bottom, the Metal Woods, would not have seen that just looking at the heat maps as powerful as they were. So now that everyone's introduced to these these variety of geospatial formats data types that are used by utilities, let's talk about how to organize, collect, and manage this mountain of information. Kevin? Thank, yeah, thanks, Tom. That was pretty pretty exciting. I think it's definitely, as I say in the commercial, car commercials, not your parents' GIS. Uh, very exciting times for, for us as, as uh, GIS people. Before we begin going into, into more detail, I wanted to launch a quick audience poll. I'm going to kick it off now and you can select on your screen. Um, and we're trying to understand which of the following present a data management challenge for your organization. Is it managing the increased volume and types of data? You can provide one or more answers. Is it providing data to more people within the business? Or are you struggling with more accurate and timely data? I'm curious to see what you folks have to say. So we'll give this a minute to run. Uh, and then I'll share the results so, so everybody can see them. And again, you can uh, select one uh, and let us know what your organization is challenged with regarding data management. All right, so I'm, now I'm going to share the results of that and we can see it all together. Looks like the majority are having uh, challenges regarding more accurate and timely data. Very interesting. Um, second looks to be providing data to more people within the business and uh, managing increased volume and types of data. Very interesting. Uh, I don't know if that kind of gels with what you had uh, as a preconceived notion in your head, but uh, very exciting to see that. We'll walk through these more as we go into uh, the rest of the presentation. So what makes good GIS data management? This is the big question. And I think we all know what happens when we don't have good data management practices in place. We can incur fines, we have poor customer service, we're making decisions based on old data or inaccurate data. 
Speaking of Tom's demonstration, it's amazing to see where GIS is today and where it's going to go in the future. Our technology, ArcGIS technology specifically, has undergone a major transformation. The question is, has your data management practices changed? and Do they take advantage of the ArcGIS platform? So when we look and discuss GIS data management, collect, organize, and maintain are the three main elements that define it. As you view this slide, many of you can place the people and departments within your organization that are responsible for the collection, organization, and maintaining of that data. The question again is, how can we do each of these better? Uh, in the survey results, 41% of you needed to have more accurate and timely data. So the question is, are there legacy workflows that create data redundancy? Is the data being updated in a timely manner? How can we improve that? Are we capturing that detailed information to support uh, new regulatory requirements or new decisions needed to be made by the business? We start with really organizing our information. The solid organization is most start by reviewing existing data models and compare those to what future system needs may be. Enterprise, system today, enterprise systems today are requiring a lot more detailed information than ever before. But organization is more than just data modeling. It includes managing multiple data types and integration with other systems of record and creating content that is then shared with users and constituents. Our users are storing asset information within the geodatabase. They're managing network topology, and they're creating a geo-information model by integrating with internal and external data sets to provide greater context. From there, we can create content that is shared with users and groups. Tom, could you please show us an example of how users are better organizing their GIS data? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So GIS has always been known for having a mountain of data. We've never been shy about that. What the brief examples I introduced is easy to see how that mountain of information can turn into a mountain range. Network folders of shapefiles or even, even enterprise geodatabases as robust as they are, are increasingly not enough for organizing these mountains of information. So what I'm going to show you today is how Portal can be used to tame these wild mountains of data. So key thing here to keep in mind, is that Portal has the ability to organize information from many sources. Its ability to store links to data stored across your organization gives it a unique ability to organize your information without having to actually move your organization's data. A popular use of the Portal for data organization is to use the gallery capabilities to create a hierarchical tree that resembles your corporate organization structure. So here on this home page, I have what you might consider the top of the utility organizational tree for electric. I have distribution, I have transmission, and I have generation. And if I click on distribution, I will drill into that corporate structure and let's uh, fix that real quick there we go and I see I saw the security that was good and I see within distribution I have my different sub departments so I can pick on engineering and within engineering I can see the layers the maps and the apps that are part of that group now that's useful very nice organized structure to access the information but oftentimes people interact and need information from more than one department in which case we want to see kind of a flattened view of the groups that you belong to instead of the hierarchy you can do that as well so here i have a listing of the groups that i belong to in this case, I'm going to scroll down and look at the generation group, and it will show me the content that has been shared with that group. And in content, again, we're talking about references to layers 
and maps and apps that do not necessarily, and even files and other content, do not necessarily have to be stored on the portal server itself. They could just be links pointing out to other data sources across your organization. Now, it's important to remember that there are also ways to organize the data which you own yourself. So I'll come up here to content, and I work on many, many projects within this portal. And what I've done is I've used the virtual folder capabilities, and I stress the word virtual, because I'm not really moving the information. I'm just organizing my pointers to this information to help me keep track. So down here I see I have different projects I've done over the years. Here is my pole inspection one, and I can see the layers, the maps, and the apps that are associated with that project that I did. So that is my way of organizing the content that I own. Now often you find yourself in need of searching for a specific piece of information that you don't know exactly which department, group, or project it was originally associated with. And again, back to the whole mountain of information idea, even here with our little portal, I have 3,128 unique pieces of information. That's way more than I want to search through. So I'm going to, first of all, use the searching capability to say, I'm looking for something that had to do with transmission as I remember it. And that quickly gets me down to 183 options. Better, but still too much. This is where I can use my additional filtering capabilities here on the left to say what I'm looking for is a layer. Okay, great. Now I'm down to 89. And as I remember it, it was a feature layer that I'm looking for. Ooh, better. Now I'm down to 46. Getting closer. Still more than I want to filter through. So as I remember it, this was something that was created a year ago during the month of April. So let me put a little custom date range on this for last April. And let's put an end date on that of May 1st. Oh, that's June 1st. We want May 1st. Why am I not getting May 1st? And let me try that one more time because it changed it on me. And we'll just go to the end of the month. And I'll get the date, the year right yet. There we go. Oh, perfect. Now I am down to one. So using the searching plus the filtering through the layers and even the date ranges, I was able to quickly go through all this information and find that service territory that I remember somebody showing me from last year. Great. So remember that organizing your information with portal makes it easier for everyone in the organization to find and benefit from that mountain of information that is available within your organization. Kevin? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that organizing, I mean, your, our customer's data is really your business's intellectual property. And organizing it and making it discoverable um, is just extending the value of it more and more throughout the day. And, and we see that on the results of the survey that 33% of you uh, have a challenge for providing data to more people within the business. So uh, we certainly see a, a lot of growth in that area. The next topic, next aspect of, of data management that we're going to discuss is collection. For many of our users, the data management lifecycle begins here. Collection is still where we see a lot of legacy workflows that do not take advantage of new technology from Esri or our partners. Collection can include design or as-built workflows, it can also include inspections or surveys of equipment in the field. 
Collection can also involve integration with or importing data from other areas of the business. Accessing data like customer service, tax records, integration with other systems of record like operations and SCADA. With the openness of the ArcGIS platform and increased spatial accuracy of collection devices in the field, there's a big opportunity for users to update those legacy collection workflows I mentioned earlier. Tom, could you please show us an example of that? Can do, Kevin. So for this and hearing in the audience poll that there's a strong interest in the need to collect data more accurately, I'm going to show something maybe you weren't expecting. I'm going to go to the field. And the focus here will be the fact that there's been a lot of changes in technology in the last few years, particularly when it comes to GPS and the ability of the GPS to communicate its location to other devices. So specifically what I'm talking about here is that there's literally a new breed of GPS devices, if you're not aware of them, that these devices can communicate their accurate location. In some cases, we're talking sub-foot accurate location via Bluetooth. And you take that and couple that with the, the release of you know, the smart devices, the mobile devices. So you think of you know, your iPhones, your, your Android phones, your, your tablets, your laptops. They all receive Bluetooth and can have that information streamed to them. And then on top of that, you have a new generation of mobile apps, such as Survey123 and Collector, that can natively consume this highly accurate GPS information. So to give you an idea of what that field data collection is like, I'm going to use Collector here on my tablet, and I'm gonna show you what that experience can be to accurately collect this information while in the field. So I'm going to zoom into an area where we're doing some work. As you see here, and I'm going to pull up my palette of features that I can collect. And this is all configurable, as I hope everybody's familiar with, with our technology. And here I have that service pipe. So I'm going to tap on that service pipe. And in the field with the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth would be streaming the, the coordinate information to me to very precisely set that new service line or that new pipe in this case. Now, in addition to that, another recent change when we think about accuracy is not just spatial accuracy, but attribute accuracy. And so in this case, I'm going to talk about barcodes. And uh, if you've seen some of the demos I've done in the past, I've shown barcode scanners where I can use the barcode scanner to auto-populate this very complex, case-sensitive, alphanumeric thing that I would hope nobody ever has to manually type in and just put it right into the barcode. So if you think about that, there's no typos here because the device is auto-populating that attribute. That's really powerful. But if we take that just a little step further and we think about, well, what does that barcode describe? Because embedded in that barcode can be a, a wealth of information. In the gas industry, we have this little standard for plastic barcodes where it's storing manufacturer, manufacturer date and the lot and the diameter and the material and the wall thickness. I mean, oodles of information. And with the recent, I'll go ahead and submit this to kind of show this, with our recent enhancement of attribute rules, we can take that data quality a step further. And while I'm in the field, I can have that information decoded from the barcode and auto-populated to show me, as I see here, that now my diameter knows it's 10 inch. That came from the barcode. It knows the wall thickness is 0.512. That came from the barcode. The manufacturer came from the barcode. Manufacturer lot number. The manufacturer component. The material. 
all came from the barcode. And then additionally, using attribute rules, I auto-populated the surface area and the pipe volume. Those were auto-calculated so that users do not have to enter this information, thus decreasing the likelihood of typos and mistakes. So improving the quality of the information that is being collected. <clears throat> you know, it was not that many years ago that the idea of accurately and efficiently collecting as-built data in the field was more fantasy than reality. With these recent advances, you think of the GPS, the Bluetooth communication, the advances in ArcGIS, the increasing demands for better quality, which you said in the first poll was the number one item, is a reality today. And more accurate data, that requirement can be met with the technology that we have. Kevin? Thanks again, Tom. Uh, maintaining GIS data is probably the most familiar data management workflow for, for folks on this call. All of you have users or groups that you've assigned to edit and update your data. You've employed standards and rules to ensure data quality throughout that process. And as your GIS implementation matured, you may have conflated your data to commercial land bases and imagery, or maybe a survey of your assets to gain spatial accuracy. Maybe you cleaned up the connectivity to more accurately reflect the network topology that you have. An often overlooked aspect of maintenance is collaboration. Maintenance can be improved by simply sharing information from the system of record to end users with domain knowledge, using their expertise to improve the quality of your data. ArcGIS provides a framework to assist with maintenance workflows from single user, multi user editing within a virgin database, domains to ensure input accuracy and automated data validation routines. And that framework is really augmented by our partner solution. Tom, could you please show us an example? Sure can, Kevin. <clears throat> so for this last demo I'm going to do today, I'm going to use ArcGIS Pro. And what I'm going to focus on are the capability that Pro has to do edit templates and edit tasks. So if you're not familiar with those, I will give you an introduction here of what those are. So I'm gonna zoom into an area where I'm gonna work in, and I'm gonna start with edit templates. And I'm gonna to show today two types of edit templates. I'll start with a feature edit template. And all a feature edit template is, is the pre-populating of some attributes to be specific. So I've got this plastic three-way T, it's a two by two by one, and if I go look at what's been pre-populated, I've pre-populated the MAOP, pre-populated the material, the diameter, uh, the length, some of that information, so that when I plop this down, all that information is preset. Nice. Now, additionally, I can go ahead and pre-populate also a service line. And in this case, I'm going to add that service line. Give it just a second while it's thinking on this. There we go. All right, so I'm going to search for my service line, and I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to do another type of edit template, which is called a group edit template. And this group edit template, when I place it, I'll just keep it real simple. We'll just make it a straight line. It's not placing just my service line with some pre-populated attributes saying, hey, I'm one inch, I'm polyethylene, that kind of stuff. It's actually going to place multiple features in a predefined configuration. So in this case, it's going to drop down my excess flow valve and my meter set. And within that meter set, I'm going to see that it's placed all the individual components that go into that meter set. Give it just a second here while it's thinking on placing all of those and all their pre-populated attributes.
All right, well, while it's thinking on that, I'm gonna jump over here to TAS, and I'm gonna show the other new capability that we have today. There we go, I always know, as soon as I move on the next thing, it always comes back. So there are my new features, and if I go ahead and zoom in to that meter set, then like I said, you see all the individual components were placed down as well with that simple two click of the service line. So group templates, very powerful. If you're not familiar with them, please take a moment of your time and, and take, get familiar with them. Now, as powerful as those are, I'm going to close my panel over here and I'm gonna show edit tasks where I can streamline my productivity just a little bit more by running through this task, they'll keep everything centered on this panel. So notice I didn't have to search this time for the T. It pre-filtered for me. And it placed, so I placed the T, got it snapped. It's pre-populating my attributes. And what I'm gonna show next is, like I showed in the field, the idea that those attribute rules, right? That decoding of the barcode. Well, that's not just a collector thing. That's awesome. That's a universal geodatabase thing now for our apps. And I can come over here and scroll down to where I have barcode. And let me go ahead and add in my barcode. There it is, and as soon as I click, you're gonna see it populated the manufacturer, the lot number, decoded that barcode, auto-populated the information, the material, the diameter, length, that, not the length, sorry, length was a pre-attribute that I'm looking for. So that is, again, the attribute rules kicking in there. And as I move on to my service lines, again, not searching, so the edit tasks are helping streamline my process here and I can very easily and quickly drop down, I'll do a simpler feature template this time to place that. And then very quickly, I will be able to move on and finish this by adding the attributes. Yeah, so, and I can also interactively with these tasks, if you're not familiar with that, There we go, interactively work with them with the task to see that information. So as, as advanced as these capabilities are, they're actually kind of basic compared to some of the additional capabilities that our business partners provide. And if you're not familiar with that and you get a chance, check them out. With that, back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Tom. Pretty exciting stuff. Creating the digital twin is something that we have strived for for a long time. Um, even today, folks are modeling cities, buildings, and facilities. It's going on right now. But before you can enable that digital twin, your organization needs to have the three key aspects of good data management in place. With good data management in place, enabling the digital twin becomes a platform-based approach. First, begin with integrating that system of record with your real-time data and your sensor feeds. This allows you to have a real-time view into your network or other data. Then, we can start automating the spatial analysis of that data being collected. This can allow you to look at predictive trends in that network and make decisions faster. Finally, enabling the enterprise to access information products of the network or provide updates on that network from both people and other system creates a two-way feedback. Users can view it all in real time and provide updates in real time as well. By implementing all three, real-time, analytics, and a system of engagement, you're enabling a platform-based approach to data management and will in turn create that digital twin of the network. I'd like to kick off a second poll to get your input. Uh, you'll see on your screen here, 
Uh, which of the three elements of data management are your biggest challenge? The ones that we just completed, organizing, collecting, and maintaining. Awesome. All right, so I'm now going to close that and share the results if you can see it. So survey says 44% of you uh, have challenges around the maintenance of your data. 34% uh, are at collecting and 22% are at organizing. That's a very interesting uh, survey result. Thank you very much for participating in that. Tom, if you could, I'm going to exit out of here. Hopefully we don't lose the, there we go, the presentation. So what do we do next, right? I think it, 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 it's always struck me uh, every time I work with customers, how the simple things have the biggest impact. We can start by setting up that web GIS portal to share information, to begin collaboration with users, to get information in and out of the field on a timely uh, manner, and begin maybe a different maintenance life cycle than we had before. Second, let's look to automate our manual and paper data collection processes with digital processes. Uh, the second, the thirty-four percent, the second biggest challenge our customers are facing is the collection of data, and I would um, venture that the majority of those are legacy workflows, um, maybe paper-based workflows. So look to automate those. Look to use partner and out-of-the-box solutions and see uh, where you can gain some some advantages there. Third, simplify and increase the accuracy of data uh, maintenance workflows. So 44% of you in the survey uh, are struggling with uh, maintenance. When you look at, at where the ArcGIS platform and framework is created, there's opportunity to simplify those workflows and increase that accuracy. Fourth is to get connected uh, with GeoNet for more information. We're going to be putting out um, blogs out there. We're going to continue this data management discussion. So you're going to see updated posts from our team there. Also, you can email us at uh, geoconnectsinfo at Esri. The address is on uh, the screen here. Uh, you can question, uh, email us with any questions or further discussions you'd like to have. With that, I'm going to hand this back over to Mr. Coolidge to kind of go through your questions uh, that you've posted with the time remaining. Tom? Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tom. We did receive uh, a number of questions. The first one I have here is, uh, does all of my data have to be in one geo database? Uh, the answer is no. That portal can be and manage your information from multiple data sources. It doesn't have to be just one repository. OK. And uh, second question, how are you getting high accuracy GPS with a phone? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty amazing stuff that you can do today. And so there's, like I mentioned earlier, I was kind of brief about it. There's this whole new generation of what they call GPS antennas. And they can be very accurate, right down to inches level of accuracy. And they communicate their information via Bluetooth. So all phones today, the smartphones, they have the ability to receive this Bluetooth communication. And then you couple that with our apps, which understand how to read and consume that. And lo and behold, your tablet or smartphone that maybe when you're trying to get driving directions is only good plus or minus 10 meters. But once it's Bluetooth connected to that GPS antenna, all of a sudden it's within a few inches of accuracy. Okay. Third question. We are thinking about creating our own barcodes. Can Esri-based apps read these? Yeah, the custom barcode thing is something that I'm hearing more and more in the industry. And the idea of you buy your, your, your assets, they come into the warehouse, you slap on your custom barcode, and then when it goes from the warehouse to the field, you can scan that. And so, yes, the, the Esri apps, assuming your barcodes, custom barcodes, uh, follow basic industry standards, we can read that. We can read that with Bluetooth barcode scanners, 
and increasingly we are enhancing our device our apps i should say to use the device's camera to capture a picture of that barcode and then pull that into your data collection whether it's survey one two three collector those kind of apps to capture that barcode information okay fourth question is about 3d can i do 3d in portal yes this is kind of one of the cool things that uh it was released a, a year or so ago that we have this thing called a scene viewer in portal it's a web app and allows you to view your 3d data right there in a web app like i showed at the beginning with the out-of-the-box portal arcgis online capabilities okay the utility network do i need utility network to use edit templates and edit tasks uh, the quick answer is no edit templates and edit tasks are a core part of arcgis pro and i also showed uh, attribute rules which are also not part of the utility network they are a core part of the geo database that's what allowed them to work with the existing collector app i've also used them with existing web apps and also i showed you they work with pro as well so very very diverse in their application okay Next question is, how do I manage all the LIDAR and imagery in my organization? So our recommendation for that is that you deploy the image server extension, which has been designed to share and manage those massive amounts of imagery that come with things like LIDAR and, and the different image formats we talked about. Uh, but also remember, there's that new drone to map thing that uh, can help you process that raw LIDAR imagery that is increasingly being collected from drones. Okay. The next question is, are you planning on having a webinar on the utility network? Yes, I'm really, really excited about the utility network stuff and, and eager to show it to folks. We are planning in the second half of this year to do a webinar. If that is not soon enough, please reach out to your Esri account rep and we'll get something set up sooner for you on a more personal basis. Okay, thanks, thanks Tom. I want to be mindful uh, of our time. We're coming up on the top of the hour. Uh, we appreciate everyone's participation. Unfortunately, we didn't get to all of the questions. We still have some questions that we need to answer. Uh, so we will be doing that in an FAQ that we'll make available to you. Also, please remember that we have a very active GeoConnects community user group uh, for all electric, gas, and telecommunications company users. This community is a great resource for you all year long. And we're active in a number of social media channels, as you see, including Twitter, LinkedIn, and GeoNet. So with that, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.